Today is Sunday, October 10th, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. I'm sure wherever you live, you're enjoying beautiful weather as we get into the fall. My favorite time of year by far. It's a little breezy today, so hopefully there won't be too much background noise. But I'd like to talk, as I normally do on Sundays, about spiritual things to try and keep the Lord's Day holy. And assuming you were at Mass today and paying attention to the readings, if you didn't pay attention to the readings or don't remember them, I suggest you take a minute pause this talk and go look up the the mass readings from Sunday October 10th and then come back to this talk but we had some great readings today at mass the first one the old testament reading was from the book of wisdom the second scripture reading was from the book of hebrews in the new testament and The Gospel reading was our Lord's interaction with a man who's referred to in Scripture as the rich young ruler. And these three passages taken together present such a liberating, exciting, and yet challenging image of life that the readings create an amazing scene in the modern church. We got to church a little bit later than usual this morning, so I sent my wife and kids in to find a spot, and I, I stood up at the back of the sanctuary because the seats were filled up. And as we went through the Mass, I was standing at the back of the sanctuary, listening to these readings, meditating on them and rereading them as we were going through the celebration, rereading them in my missal, because I just found them to be such good readings. And just going back and forth between the readings and the, the sight of this modern Catholic church. And you can see there's such, a, there's such a difference between the message the Scripture teaches us and the image of the modern church. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. When we read these passages, first of all, the reading in Wisdom explains that wisdom is the greatest of all possessions, and that a man should be willing to exchange anything for wisdom. Wisdom should be the only thing a man seeks, better than all riches, better than health itself, better than even sleep, the passage says. A man should exchange everything that he has for wisdom. And then we go on to read in Hebrews of how the Word of God pierces through the human soul and reveals the truth to us in a supernatural way. The Word of God is powerful, the reading says, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce through the human flesh Like David said in the Psalms, the word of the Lord converts the soul. And then the passage in the Gospel, Jesus is on a journey carrying out his ministry and he's approached by a man who calls out to him and says, Good teacher. And Jesus immediately corrects him and says, 
Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. Very interesting response. We know that Christ is divine, that He is the Son of God, and yet He refers in this mysterious way, He responds in this mysterious way to this man and says, No one is good but God. But more importantly, He asks, Why do you call me good? What is it that you have in mind when you greet me as good teacher. The man doesn't answer that question. He goes on with his own question. The reason why he approached Jesus to begin with, and he asks Jesus, what must I do that I may gain eternal life? What must I do that I may gain eternal life? And just think, how often have you ever had someone come up to you? How often has one of your children, one of your friends, one of your relatives come up to you and ask, what must I do to gain eternal life? This is a very rare situation. This young man is in a rare condition. He's a wealthy man, and he appears to also be a, an influential man. Some, some Bible translations, I don't know if it's in the original text or not, refer to him as a young ruler, some kind of prince or influential young man. But he's got influence, and he's got riches, and he's seeking Jesus out to ask him this question, what must I do that I may gain eternal life? And you can see that with riches, with influence, possessing those things that every man desires and works for, there's no rest. There's no peace in his soul. He knows that he remains unfulfilled and unsatisfied. One of the, one of the worst evils in life is that men who seek power and riches never obtain them. And they continue through their whole lives to imagine that they would be satisfying if they were obtained. And it's far, worse, it's far worse to never get them and always be tempted by them than to get them. Even if one gets them by sinful means, because once they're obtained, it becomes apparent that they're not what a man imagines them to be. And those who do obtain riches, who do obtain power, quickly realize that these things do not bring them the happiness that they had hoped for. And this man appears to be in such a state of mind, having wealth, having influence, knows that he's not fulfilled. Like St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless until they rest in, in Thee, speaking to God. And we find this rich, young ruler searching, unhappy, asking, what must I do that I may gain eternal life? And keep in mind this reality that this is not a question that you or I get asked very often by our neighbors or relatives. 
This is a rare encounter. This is a rare conversation. A rare opportunity. And Jesus responds, <clears throat> excuse me, again in a in a surprising way. Jesus doesn't <clears throat> He doesn't go into the modern mode of bowing down to the seeker and doing anything it takes to please someone who who visits the church or who is open to religious discussion. Jesus responds to him pretty bluntly. He basically says, you already know what you need to do to inherit eternal life. Keep the commandments. And Jesus lists the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. On and on he goes through the commandments. It's important to notice that when Jesus names and lists the commandments... He only names the last five or six of the Ten Commandments. He doesn't name the first three commandments. And we know that the Ten Commandments are divided into two different sets of laws. The first set of laws commands man in relation to God... The second set of commandments commands men in relation to man's neighbor or fellow man. Jesus names those commandments that refer to a man's duty to his neighbor. Jesus says, you know the commandments, and he lists them. And to this, the young ruler responds and says, All of these I have kept from my youth up. All of these I have kept from my youth up. And if we're, if we can assume that this man is telling the truth, then this adds to this story the important point that not only is this a young, wealthy, influential man, but he appears to be a man who has obtained his wealth honestly. He hasn't stolen. He hasn't defrauded. He's not an adulterer. He sounds like a pretty good man. And he's wealthy and influential. He says all of these things... I have kept from my youth until now. Yet still, it's obvious that something is missing. And Jesus responds to him at this point and says, One thing you lack. One thing you lack. This is such a powerful response. You have everything. You have everything everyone seeks. You have everything everyone works for, studies for, sacrifices for. You have everything. But you don't have eternal life because there is one thing that you lack. One thing you lack. And it's important to remember that this passage is read in the context at Mass of the passage from Wisdom. 
which just finished telling us that wisdom is the principal thing, urging us to seek wisdom rather than gold. That saying that all gold is like sand compared to wisdom. Well, this man has that gold. This man has all of those other things. But one thing he lacks. One thing he lacks. And and what he lacks is wisdom. He doesn't have the answer to the most, in question, the most important question of all. He doesn't have the most valuable thing. He has many things. But he lacks one thing. And the one thing he lacks is the most valuable thing. He doesn't have wisdom. He doesn't know how to obtain eternal life. He lives assuming he's a Jew because he keeps the Jewish commands, but that's not necessarily true because if we were to look at that list of commands that Jesus read, we could say that many Greeks and Romans kept those commands. And perhaps <clears throat> perhaps Jesus named or listed those commandments because they were commandments that could be asked of a Gentile. I'm not sure. I'd have to look more into that passage and and see what the details reveal. But this man claims to have kept and be living in obedience to the commandments has everything men desire and yet lacks not just one thing but the most important thing. He lacks wisdom. And what's most important about wisdom as the passage from the book of wisdom says is that nothing is of any value to a man who doesn't have wisdom. Nothing is equal to wisdom. Nothing can replace wisdom. And everyone knows that. We we all will... And there's no one who will deny that. But what the passage goes on to say is that wisdom brings all of those other things. And so we don't need to choose between riches, health, temporal happiness on one side and wisdom on the other side. We choose between those things those temporal benefits without wisdom on one side and wisdom with those temporal benefits on the other side. And yet men despise wisdom. They choose temporal benefits without wisdom rather than wisdom with temporal benefits. Any time we're taught about wisdom in Scripture, we're told that wisdom brings all of the benefits of life with it. For example, when Solomon famously prayed to God for wisdom, which is what the reading in the Book of Wisdom is referring to, Solomon asks God for wisdom and God says to Solomon that because you asked for wisdom and you didn't ask for temporal benefits, I will give you those temporal benefits with 
wisdom. We're never asked, and this is, this is one of the problems with modern religion, we're never asked by God to choose between temporal benefits and wisdom. We're asked to choose temporal benefits with wisdom or temporal benefits without wisdom. And most men, nearly all men, choose temporal benefits without wisdom. And the reason why they choose that is the only way that someone can have temporal benefits with wisdom is to first be willing to exchange them for wisdom, to purchase wisdom as the only desire in life, and then allow that wisdom to work itself out in a man's life and produce the fruits of that wisdom, which are the temporal benefits that allow a man to live happily in this life and be useful and also enjoy eternal life. Because man has to exchange riches for wisdom, man chooses to live without wisdom, thinking that he can keep those benefits. But he ends up losing them involuntarily at some point, either in life, by failures, or at death. Jesus says to this young man, one thing you lack. And he gives this man three instructions. And these are very interesting. First, he says, go and sell everything you have. Go and sell everything you have. Remember, this is a wealthy man. The man comes to Jesus with an important question. What must I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus says, Go and sell everything you have. Take the proceeds from those sales and distribute that money among the poor. And Jesus makes him a promise. Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And we see a very simple challenge presented to this man. He is asked to make a trade. Jesus says to him, I want you to make this trade. I want you to trade all of your temporal possessions, all of your earthly treasure, I want you to trade it for treasure in heaven. I want you to exchange your worldly wealth for heavenly wealth. These are the first two instructions Jesus gives, but then he gives a third. He says, Then come follow me. The wording is all very interesting. Jesus, the first set of commands, he tells the man to go away. And then he tells the man that when certain conditions have been fulfilled, he should come. Go, sell all you have 
and give it to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. It's important to note that the man would be in possession of treasure in heaven before he comes and follows Jesus. Listen to the words. Go, sell all you have, and give it to the poor. Then, oh, I'm sorry. Go, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. Listen to that again. Go, sell all that you have, and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Then, come, and follow me. So what kind of man follows Christ? Poor men or wealthy men? Well, it depends on how you think of wealth. If we're worldly-minded, thinking of temporal things, it will appear that the men who follow Christ are poor men. But Christ doesn't invite poor men to follow him. He invites wealthy men to follow him. However, Christ doesn't consider the possession of material riches, of temporal riches, to be wealth. He tells men to exchange temporal riches for heavenly riches because this makes a man truly wealthy. And then he calls the wealthy the truly wealthy, to come and follow him. It's interesting. The story goes on. This rich young man suddenly has lost his interest in eternal life. He stopped in his tracks, as it were. And it says that he walked away because he had many possessions. And we can meditate on these things forever. He came to Jesus and greeted Jesus as good teacher. And remember, Jesus caught him and said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Jesus puts him to the test right from the beginning. with this statement that no one is good but God alone. Because that's the way that we should think. We should think that no one is good but God alone. The reason I believe Jesus did that was because he knew that the man was coming with at least some hope of flattery. Good teacher. And Jesus immediately cut that down, brushed that greeting aside, and turned it instead into a correction and said, Why? What made you call me good? And of course, the rich young man, as I said, didn't answer that question. He just went on with his question. Then he asked, What must I do to obtain eternal life? And we can see that when he came and asked that question, 
He was coming to make a deal. He was coming to ask what eternal life would cost. Whether or not it was something that he would be willing to trade for. And when Jesus told him the price, he decided he didn't want it. So he had his answer, but the price was too great. This man wouldn't trade his temporal riches for eternal life because he valued his temporal riches to be greater than the benefits of eternal life. And on that day, he walked away from Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who had invited him to come and follow him. But he walked away, for he had many possessions. Now, of course, everyone who reads that passage imagines some rich guy they don't think of themselves Jesus said what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul and we imagine some billionaire arrogantly living with disregard for God and His commandments, no thought of his soul or life after death. The Psalms say that man in, his wis- man in his riches lacks wisdom. He is like the beasts that perish. He lives like an animal, like a soulless mortal, like some temporal creature made just to live this brief physical life before dying and returning into the earth, vanishing into nothing. We think of the billionaire, we think of the Jeff Bezos or the Elon Musk, and we say, look at these men. They have so much money, but they don't have God. But there's another way to think about this that's even more frightening. To some degree, to some degree, it's reasonable for a wealthy man to choose his riches over true religion. After all, he's very wealthy. He has great wealth, great influence, great power, great security, humanly speaking. It's reasonable for a man to choose to go all in on this earthly life when he is an extremely wealthy man. We can understand why a man would want to do that. And when Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We can imagine and talk, talk, talk about how foolish the rich men are to cling to their riches and not follow God. But there's another way, as I said, to think about this. When we sin, and if, in the end, 
we are found to not be among those who are saved by our own failure to worship God through faith, hope, and charity, we will have lost our salvation not for the whole world, but for nothing. Again, the wealthy man, if he loses his soul, we can understand why. Because he had great wealth and it was hard for him to let go of. But when we consider that it's not just the wealthy who are not saved, but many poor who not for billions or even trillions or even millions lose their soul, but who do it for much, much smaller benefits than these. we need to realize how much more grievous it is for us to not follow Christ when we're not being asked to go and sell millions of dollars worth of possessions and give them away to the poor. We're being asked to exchange trinkets for eternal life. And many of us won't do it in the end. That's far more frightening to think about than to idly talk about the billionaires who don't worship God. If you've seen the the film, A Man for All Seasons, you may remember near the end when Thomas More is being unjustly judged, and when Richie Rich bears false witness against him. And Thomas More is left to wonder why this man, who he was kind to, would do this, would would be willing to bear false witness against him, would be willing to forfeit his own soul and commit this mortal sin. St. Thomas More marvels at the foolishness of this man, Rich. And then Thomas More notices a certain medallion hanging around the man's neck, and he realizes that it's a symbol of some office that he's been given. And Thomas More, in the scene, in the trial, asks if he may look to see this medallion. And he takes it in his hand and he looks at it and he sees that it is a symbol of some office held in Wales. Thomas More marvels and looks at Richard and says, What profit does it give a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then he asks, But for whales? Richard didn't sell his soul for the whole world. He sold it for an office in Wales. And we can see Thomas More in that scene grieving at the foolishness. Thomas More was the Chancellor of all of England. And he sacrificed his office for the sake of his soul. And here he looks at this man 
who sacrifices his soul for something worth less than a fraction of England. And that's the condition and choice of most human beings. Most of us are not asked to sacrifice great riches to follow Christ. We're asked to sacrifice little things to merit great things. But there are many in the world who are asked to sacrifice great things, humanly speaking, to merit great things. And this rich young man walks away choosing not to take up this offer to no longer ask about eternal life now that he's heard the cost. And he walks away sad, it says, for he had many possessions. And then Jesus responds to the people who remain standing with him after this young man walks away and he says, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? And it says in the passage that his disciples marveled or were amazed when he said this. They were amazed that Jesus would say that it is hard for the rich to inherit eternal life. He's acknowledging the truth. It's hard for them. It's hard for the rich to make this exchange because they have so much. It's hard for them. And again, on the flip side of that, it's not hard for the rest of you. And we have no excuse for the stupid things that we cling to when we're not asked to give up great treasures, great riches, great offices, great lands, great titles, great inheritances. We're not asked to give up these things. We're asked asked to give up trifles and trinkets. There were in history many saints who gave up great riches. One example that's at the top of my mind is St. Francis Xavier, who became a Jesuit with St. Ignatius of Loyola in the 1500s. St. Francis Xavier came from a very wealthy and prominent family, sacrificed it all to become a Jesuit, to become a missionary to India in the Far East. Many saints have sacrificed great riches for the sake of the kingdom of God. And this is the choice, the trade, that Jesus calls all of us to make whether we have great riches or very little. We may not even have riches at all. We may not even have health. But Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him that we may have treasure in heaven and obtain eternal life. It's hard for the rich to enter heaven. Now let's 
let's meditate on the practical implications of this in our lives. If we seek to become wealthy, if we seek to become wealthy, we study to become wealthy, we work to become wealthy, we buy and sell and trade and save to become wealthy, and it's true that it is hard for the wealthy to obtain eternal life. The work that we do in attempting to become wealthy makes it harder and harder for us to obtain eternal life. Think about that. The more we work to become wealthy, the harder it becomes to obtain eternal life because at some point we're going to have to make that trade. At some point we're going to have to make that trade whether we're young or old. And the richer we make ourselves, the harder it's going to be. And Jesus warns us in this life of the young man that it is hard for the wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God because their possessions prevent them. Now, this is where my thoughts turned from this passage to the church in which I stood today. Because when I stand in church, my family attends a local parish out here. It's the only parish in our county, so it's packed. But when you look around at all the people in the parish, you just see the kind of people that Jesus spoke of when he said, Come to me, you that are weary and heavy laden. The parish is filled with the weary and heavy laden. Weary, weary from work, heavy laden with anxieties, problems of all kinds. The church is filled with the weary and heavy laden. Catholic people are weary, stressed, anxious, busy, tired, frustrated, depressed. They have all the same problems that the world has. The difference is that they bring those problems in and sit them down in the pews on Sunday. And others don't. But they have all the same evils in their lives. Same problems. But it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. Because when Jesus says, Come to me, you that are weary and heavy laden, he says to them, And you shall find rest. Relief. You will not continue to be weary and heavy laden. Jesus says, come to me and you shall find rest. Your condition will change. And yet when we look around, we find that the condition of Christians in modern society doesn't change. 
They come in weary and heavy laden, and they remain weary and heavy laden. They talk about work, they talk about school, even homeschool families talk about diplomas and college admission and accreditation and anxieties about this and about that and what about if you don't do this and you don't do that. Modern Christian society is a society that is weary and heavy laden, anxious and troubled with many things like Martha. And as I stood there in the sanctuary, looking at the people, listening to the homily and the prayers, you can just feel the disinterest. Everyone is there to check the box, to fulfill the so-called Sunday obligation. And it just so happens that there's a guest priest at Mass on this Sunday. And so at the end of Mass, when everyone would be dismissed, the priest needs to stand up and talk to the congregation. And you can just feel this release of frustration that the Mass has to go on longer when we've come to the end, when we've fulfilled our obligation. Now we have to listen to this message from this priest. And you can see people start to take children out. People start to grab their bags and and head out while they can. And this is reserved for just before the final blessing to keep everyone trapped like a captive audience because this visiting priest has something to say. And it turns out that this visiting priest is the priest in our diocese who is the chaplain assigned to serve the campus ministries at two local universities. And I, I just think about this, this paradox. We just finished listening to the story of the rich young ruler. And here is a chaplain who attempts attempts to minister to Catholic kids who are pursuing college degrees and careers at two local universities, neither of which are Catholic. The first university he serves is the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And the second is Wingate University, which is actually a a Baptist college. He's the campus minister who attempts to serve the Catholic students studying at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and Wingate University. And we just got finished listening to the account of Jesus calling the rich young ruler to sell everything that he has, give it to the poor, and come follow him and warn that it is hard for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. We look around and we see a congregation filled of weary, heavy-laden people. 
and we speak about young people in the church seeking temporal degrees and qualifications that will allow them to go and pursue wealth. And this is why I say the church is stuck. And when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about the clergy. I'm talking about the church as a whole and primarily the laity. But the church is stuck in this place that is no place. We know that we're not seeking wisdom. Our schools clearly prove that we're not interested in wisdom. We could go back 100, 200 years and see what, educated look, what education looked like when men sought wisdom. And our schools are not like those schools. Our children do not study the subjects that those children were made to study. Our schools do not teach the subjects that those schools taught. We are not seeking wisdom. We are explicitly seeking worldly wealth, worldly occupations for the sake of wealth, and so on. And yet we're reading passages like that from the Book of Wisdom, which contradicts everything we do. That from the Book of Hebrews, telling us how powerful the Word of God is, which we almost entirely neglect in modern education and private life, and how we should choose to sell all we have and give it to the poor and follow Christ, that we may have treasure in heaven and eternal life. And we know that we're not living that life. Everyone in the pews who listens to that reading knows that that life that Jesus is describing is a life that we're not living. We know that. We know that. And then what happens is these readings are followed with talk, all of the same old talk. Talk about how money is not important. Talk about how Nothing lasts forever. Talk about how nothing is more important than our souls. Talk and talk and talk. All the same old talk. And yet every one of us knows that tomorrow morning we're getting up and we're going to work for money. And we're going to spend the strength of our day on Monday doing work that brings us money. And we're going to do that again on Tuesday, and we're going to do that again on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. The work that we do with all of our strength, our nine-to-five strength, the work that we do is for money, and yet we Imagine that by turning around on Sunday and talking about how unimportant money is, we're somehow living the life that Jesus talked about. As if criticizing money is what Jesus called us to. And what we see in modern society is that people work to purchase houses, cars, health insurance, medicines, vacations, clothing, jewelry, on and on and on, televisions, computers, on and on and on. But this modern religion has deluded us to think that if we're able to turn around and simply say, Oh, I don't care about these things. I love God more than any of these things I possess. 
that we have fulfilled the call of Christ to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to follow Him. And yet, on Monday, we go back to work to earn more money. Why this contradiction between our everyday life and what comes out of our mouths? We all know that this is the same old talk. And we know that it's not the life that Jesus is talking about. Jesus wasn't fixing up the flower garden in front of his house in Israel when he spoke of the need to come and follow him. He wasn't at the car wash washing his car when he spoke to a neighbor about the need to sell all of his possessions. Jesus was a homeless man who was living the very life that he was calling men to join him in. And this was crystal clear because in the passage we read today, Peter, a married man, says to Jesus, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus' talk about going and selling all that you have and coming and following him was not just some cute talk, some figurative language about leaving your possessions in your heart and following God in your heart. The disciples understood very clearly that this was a practical and objective message. And they literally left everything and followed him. We know how the apostles lived. We know how the saints lived. And we know that we are not living the life that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. We know when we read that wisdom is the principal thing, we know that we are not seeking wisdom as the principal thing. We know that. And yet, we don't make a change. And I think there's an important reason why we don't make a change. And and I'm not saying these things to criticize and beat on people. I'm saying this because I think our situation reveals a problem that we can fix. Revealing a problem to us that we have to respond to and solve. The reason why we read these passages, we read about the saints We know we're not living the life that St. Francis lived or that Jesus called this man to live or that the apostles lived. We know we're not living that life. We know we're working every day just for more money. We know we're going to school talking about what we're going to do for money when we grow up. And we know that that's not the life that Jesus is talking about. But the problem is that we're a society that simply criticizes and then doesn't do anything. We're a society that points out the flaws in our own lives confesses the flaws in our own lives. We agree 
that this and that and that are evil. We agree. This is evil, that's evil, this is evil. We agree. We agree on all kinds of moral issues, things that God condemns. We hear God's condemnation of these things, and we, with our mouths, testify, I agree, that is evil. And so, we remove ourselves, if we're, if we're actually good, we remove ourselves from those evil practices, and we stop there. We remove ourselves from evil, and then we imagine that we will obtain eternal life by simply avoiding the evil things. But this is not what God commands us. St. Paul says, cease to do evil. Cease to do evil. And we understand that. But he goes on and says, learn to do good. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. Jesus didn't tell the man, obey the commandments, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't defraud your neighbor. That was just step one. He said, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. That was step one. And that's where most Christians live. They live having, to some degree, completed step one. And we hear the stories of how the man was a drug addict and he's been sober for ten years. And we all applaud. Great. You know, he's not doing drugs anymore. We read about the girl who got pregnant and was considering abortion but chose not to have an abortion. And we applaud. We applaud because... She did not do what is evil. Or a criminal who vows to no longer commit the crimes that he committed before. And we applaud. Modern Christians cease to do evil, but they stay in the world. They cease to do evil, but they stay in the same schools, in the same neighborhoods, in the same businesses. They cease to do evil, but they do not come and follow. They stay in the world. And this is why they continue to go on weary and heavy laden. They know that the life that they're living is a miserable life. Because they are not willing to undertake the challenge and the work of the next step, which is to learn to do good. Rather than criticize and condemn the things that are evil, which is right, they don't have enough zeal, enough strength, enough will to move forward and create what is good. The parent can look at the child and say, no, you may not watch this show. No, you may not hang out with that boy. No, you may not eat this food. No, no, no. You may not do evil. But having forbidden all of the evil things, they then stay. Rather than moving forward 
to the positively good things. Jesus asked this rich young man to leave his material possessions to come and join him in doing good, building the kingdom of God, not just condemning the kingdom of the world, the city of man, not just condemning and criticizing the way of the ungodly, but taking the next step to actually positively build the kingdom of God. The man had to give up his possessions in order to make this transition. He had to quit his first job in order to take this second job. And he chose not to. He chose to keep that first job. He chose that job security, that life that he was comfortable with, the life that he knew and felt secure in. He chose to stay there rather than learn to do good. And this, I think, is what plagues modern Christianity. It's a weary, heavy-laden, unhappy society of people that is trying to cease to do evil, but is trying to cover up its unwillingness to learn to do good. It's willing to criticize the public school system, willing to criticize selfish, greedy politicians, willing to criticize the profit of pharmaceutical companies and hospitals that turn huge profits off of human sickness and suffering that capitalize on pandemics, willing to criticize that, point that out and say, that, that's not good. But then they stop there. They don't create the good school. They don't return to wisdom as the end of education. They stay there. They stay in the mud, as it were thinking that by simply saying no to things while they remain in the mud, that they're living the Christian life. They stay working in the same industry, working for the same company. They stay in the same university. They continue pursuing the same degree, thinking that by avoiding the dirty, water-cooler conversations, they can separate themselves from the world, be salt and light, without asking why they're even working for that secular company that has nothing to do with the work of the kingdom of God. Why they can't start their own Christian business that not only ceases to do evil, but also seeks positively to do good. Why they have to work for unbelievers. Why they have to work for ungodly companies. Why they can't create positive alternatives. Why they can't create their own solutions to the problems and not be dependent in so many ways, or I should say in every way, on unbelievers, which requires them to constantly compromise or constantly struggle to tread water while competing with unbelievers in 
an unbelieving environment. When we live in a free market society where you're free to start your own business, cure the problem yourself, produce your own solution, build your own company, start your own school, educate your own children, positive, 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 constructive. Why do Christians stay in the mud? That's the plague of modern Christianity. The, the, the idea that you can cease to do evil, but not learn to do good. And live in this limbo of culture and life and education and society and pretend that you're living the life that Jesus talks about in the New Testament, that the saints chose to live, that the wise men chose to live through history. We've come to a certain point as Christians in modern society, but we need to move to the next level. We need to move away from this critical commentary on everything that exists, and we need to shut up, stop talking, stop criticizing, and start building Christian alternatives that actually positively do good. That's a whole different level of Christian living. And there's a reason why Christians don't want to do it. Criticism is easy. Creating an alternative solution is very, very hard. And this is the decision, I believe, that the the wealthy man in the gospel made. He was willing to avoid evil. He was willing to avoid evil. He liked the idea of having eternal life. But the next step Trading his earthly possessions, comforts, securities, to become a part of the team that was going to actually go into the world and make disciples and build a new kingdom? No. He had no interest in that life. And I don't think we see how that rich young man walking away from Jesus explains the current state of the Christian culture that we see, especially in America. We're at church, we're checking the box, we're not breaking the commandment, But boy, we sure would like for this Mass to be over so we can go home. Having checked the box, go home, put on the football game, sit back, and enjoy a day off because we have to go to work tomorrow. And this is our day off, our day off of work. Back back to the office tomorrow. Back to the daily grind, as we call it. Go make that paycheck. Earn that money. Pay the mortgage. Pay the utility bills for these houses and cars that we don't care about. We know that we're kidding ourselves. We know that when we read about wisdom, 
This is an exciting, liberating message in sacred scripture. When we read Christ talking to people in the gospel, his message is radical, otherworldly, transforming, glorious, saving. We know when we read the New Testament and the lives of the saints that we're reading about a life that we ourselves are not participating in, are not imitating. We're cheering from the sidelines when we're supposed to be on the field. After all, we're members of the so-called church militant. And yet we're like children watching the soldiers fight from the sidelines or on television. The positive work of creating Christian alternatives and solutions for the problems in the world is a work that Christians are largely refusing to take up. And what Christ calls us to in the gospel is that life. Not merely ceasing to do evil, which would make us good Buddhists, but to learn to do good, which requires faith, hope, and charity. Things that the Buddhists don't have. And that's the challenge that we face if we want to get out of this weary, heavy-laden, yet Christian dilemma. Talking against the evils of the world, but not creating alternatives. We're either going to choose to start creating alternatives or we're just going to lose everything while we kid ourselves thinking that while we sit at home in our living room or in our cubicle at work or on our computer using some software platform created by people whose system of values we criticize, we tell ourselves that we're superior because we think differently while we become more and more dependent on the ungodly because we're not developing the solutions, we're not producing the necessities We're not organizing the schools and leading the schools. We're not creating the colleges and universities. We're not starting the businesses that don't merely avoid evil, but positively do what is good. And I'll finish this talk up with a passage from Romans 12 that I quote all the time where St. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. And listen to this. This is, this is heroic Christian language. This is the language of a man who turned the world upside down. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? By the study of wisdom. By the study of the Word of God, like we read today in the Epistle to the Hebrews. To what end? That you may know what is the positive, constructive, active will of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. 
This is what's wrong with modern Christian society. We don't want to steal. We don't want to kill. We don't want to commit adultery. We don't want to defraud our neighbor. But we don't want to take the next step, which is to go and make and do and build and transform. And until we take up that challenge, we're like the man who simply walks away and chooses to not follow Christ. And what will we have for it? Our current job, our house, some money in the bank, place in a nice neighborhood, go to church on Sunday, maybe say a daily rosary, maybe do more, maybe homeschool, but, you know, don't go too far from the modern curriculum because got to get a job, got to go to college. We'll stay close. Until we change that, we're going to be the weary and heavy laden talking Christians. The salt that has lost its saltiness. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that kind of a person. I don't want to live that life. I don't want to be that kind of Christian. I want to be a saint. I want to live like the apostles. I want to follow Christ. I want to go to bed at night knowing that the life that I'm living is the life that Jesus taught us about, the life that the saints lived. I don't want to be a lukewarm, critical Christian talking about problems, yet dependent on the ungodly and doing the things that I criticize in others, imagining that because I criticize them, I'm different. I don't want to be that kind of Christian. I want to learn to do what's good. I want to build Christian alternatives. I want to seek wisdom rather than material possessions. I want to have treasure in heaven. And I want to follow Christ and know that I'm following Christ. We have to create the positive solutions, starting with schools, moving to businesses, colleges, universities, and realizing that the alternative life is present, is right before our eyes, present in religious vocations, present in the priesthood, not just religious vocations, but also Lay vocations, third order religious communities. Ministries for laymen, like the permanent diaconate in the church. Missionary work, work in education. Christian business work. These opportunities are all in front of us. They're all present. And these are the works This is the life that Christ calls us to, a life that's different, a life that's creative and constructive and positive, positively holy and good and influential, not idle and critical, but dead and lifeless, impotent. I know that I want to be a living, working Christian. And if you're listening to this talk, I bet you have that same desire. And you're seeking, seeking more, seeking something different. And I hope that this helps you to think about 
what it is that you might be seeking vaguely, that I might help you to seek it more explicitly and directly. I hope that you find this talk helpful. I hope that it's a helpful meditation for a Sunday afternoon. I know that this meditation was helpful for me, and I'm thankful that I can look forward to getting back to work this week, not for money, but knowing that I am working to build a Christian alternative. And there's opportunities for you to do that as well. God bless.